Hey everyone, it's Heather from Cooperatives First. This recording was from our panel discussion on September 15th, 2021, where we talked about arts, culture, and economic development. We were joined by three expert panelists who have used arts and culture to be a tool for economic development. I want to say another huge thank you to our panelists, Nicole, Patricia, and Chantel, for being on this panel and sharing their insights with us. If you have any questions about this webinar or an upcoming webinar, feel free to email me at heather at cooperativesfirst.com. To see registrations for any of the upcoming webinars, go to cooperativesfirst.com slash webinars. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy. Okay, so let's start off with our first question. And I'm going to go uh, pick an order here just so we can kind of get a little bit of a round going. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask Nicole to speak first and then Patricia and then Chantel. So the first question I'm going to ask is, um, we're just going to dive right into this here. There's no warm up questions here. You already had your warm up questions in your breakout sessions, yes. so you're warmed up. Okay, so the first question is about why it's important to foster arts and culture initiatives. Um, of course, there's probably a lot of friendly people on this call towards arts and culture, but really in your mind, why is it important in your job and in your role, which is different for all of you. So from your perspective, why is it important? And I want to talk about the benefits here and to use benefits in the broadest sense that you can. Um, however you think benefits applies to you, the economic benefits, the social benefits, the mental health benefits, all those. Um, so go ahead, Nicole, why is it important? Okay, um, so I, I think um, of arts and culture, similar to other departments of the town, although it's not a department of the town, it's, it's, it's a separate entity in our community. Uh, we have our, our Station Arts Cooperative and that um, the programs and, and events that they offer uh, enrich and add to the quality of life of not only the residents, but the visitors as well. Um, and bringing those visitors into town obviously has been offs for, for businesses. You know, it brings people together to connect and to share ideas and perspectives, which um, actually allows for positive change. Uh, it's, you know, um, it's good to have that interaction with, with from outside of the community so that um, you're not getting stuck in that same rut all the time. Um, you know, it also involves other areas such as schools. Um, the schools get brought into the center and, um, you know, the children learn about different arts and culture. It, it um, emphasizes reconciliation and, and puts them on that path towards that. Um, and it also, uh, and I think this is really important, besides the local artists that come to the station, we also have Canadian artists and international artists. And so it's a higher level of, of, um, of entertainment, I guess. And um, it just allows people to access that. Patricia, you're next. <laughs> I don't know if you just wanna jump straight in, feel free. Like that's how this panel is gonna work. Sorry, I just realized I was muted too. Um, so for me, like looking at it from an economic development perspective, so I have two backgrounds. I have the municipal background, but I'm also a published author and writer and had a writing company. So um, I come at it from both sides so I can, um, I can speak to the benefits on both sides, partaking in the arts, but also from the economic development side. So in Canada, um, the arts and culture sector contributes $60 billion. This is pre-COVID numbers, of course, but $60 billion to our economy. So that's 3.3% 3, 3 of our GDP is um, coming from the arts and culture sector. And so for a community to um, not foster that, that's the kind of, um, that's a 3.3% of your economy that you're turning your back on. And actually the um, communities that have really high involvement in the arts are seeing an even greater level of their GDP being um, contributed to the arts and culture sector. So I, I see it from the economic perspective. Um, we wouldn't turn our back on any other industry when we're kind of fostering industry in our community. So um, this one in particular actually builds communities at a really high level because you see the regeneration factor in a community related to the arts and culture sector 
at a much higher rate than you do in a lot of the other sectors that we do try and foster in our communities. So um, there's that community development perspective as well of every time someone takes part in an artistic event in the community, it actually has been scientifically shown to tie them into their community in a greater sense of purpose in their community. So uh, for example, we just did a paint the underpass project. We had a long um, skinny underpass that went under our major corridor through the city this weekend. And uh, we, we, we spent $3,000 as a community and uh, bought paint and invited every single community group that's possible into the arts tunnel to have and dedicated a space. And what happened was we had over 200 people impacted um, coming down, people that wouldn't normally partake in the arts um, because we opened it up to all non-artists. You didn't have to be an artist to participate. And then everybody became an artist. And we had 200 people come down and now we've got this really vibrant space. And those 200 people have been promoting it on social media. We're, we're seeing people coming back and showing their families what they've created. Um, and we really had people from every segment of society coming. Um, we had newcomers, we had people with disabilities, we had um, community groups, hockey players, um, like people you wouldn't particularly necessarily see in those kinds of spaces came out and took part as part of a group and now feel ownership of a space that was really quite desolate before. So um, that kind of community building through artistic pursuits for $3,000 at the city, we can't, we can't buy that kind of um, buy-in into our community. So there's that piece. There's the, there's the impacts on your real estate market. Um, the, the bigger and um, more exciting venues you have for art spaces in your community really does develop the space around those art spaces. Um, so we have two different theaters in the city of Camrose. We have a, the largest vaudeville stage in uh, North America. And then we have the uh, Peter Lougheed Performing Arts Center as well, which is the largest um, performing arts stage outside of Edmonton in the Central Alberta region. So um, we have a, a complete gamut of the type of live performances that we can do. And we've seen that the dance, um, the dance groups that come in, I think it's in March or April, they're in our, our city for a couple of weeks and they generate $8 million worth of business in our community for those couple of weeks. Like it's, it's a tremendous amount of regeneration in the economy once you start bringing in um, significant arts events. So um, that's, that's the cold notes of my why, but I'll pass it over to Chantel. Thank you. I um, get to be the third, so I get to come up with something that you guys haven't said. Um, but I guess one of, the, one of the things with arts and culture initiatives is that they are typically, and in a lot of small, smaller communities, uh, it's difficult to measure and really create that impact and be able to define exactly what that impact is. So um, as far as the actual footprint of the creative sector on local economies, it really does, like as I heard from these two, um, spread out into a lot of different areas that don't necessarily get measured. So a lot of the times, like obviously you're say potentially creating jobs and attracting new investments and those kind of obvious pieces, generating tax revenues if you have sales and product and those types of pieces. Um, but obviously then you're building on your tourism, you're building on your neighborhood renewal, your community renewal, your place making, you get really authentic place making strategies when you're dealing with your local artisans and your creative people who are within a community and a lot of the times in particular in smaller communities these are people who um, are passionate about what they're doing and they have a craft they don't necessarily see the pathway to growing that into a business so as far as the benefits of supporting the arts and culture is that you can wind up with a really wide variety of um, economic initiatives for your community or your region that really do support whether it's your workforce development and your training, your say if you have downtown or cultural area rehabilitation efforts that are going on in real estate, um, stabilizing some of those markets. Um, one of the things with 
arts, culture, events, and a lot of those more quality of life pieces is that when it comes to attracting businesses, attracting new talent, in particular younger talent and skilled talent, is those quality of life pieces are becoming far more important for people and for businesses when they're looking at where they're going to attract who they're going to attract and what they're going to attract and where they're going to locate themselves. So if your community is lacking, say, in cultural or experience-based or arts and arts and cultural-based um, assets, it may be time to look at those because those may be things that are potentially turning people away from relocating or locating their business in your community if they don't necessarily feel like it's going to provide the talent that you're looking, that the business are going to need or provide the quality of life that those staff, employees, or artisans themselves who may flush out into larger centers based on perceived larger markets, if they can get that support right at home, there's really authentic and um, really strong placemaking opportunities in that with supporting these types of initiatives in their communities. So I wonder if it would be safe to say that almost everyone, like in terms of attracting people to your community, that it's almost a given that people expect something um, in terms of arts and culture, like they expect something else, like in terms of quality of life and the arts and culture is something that could be that. I mean, don't have to comment on that now, but I just had that thought when you were talking. So, okay, fantastic. I love where this is going. Um, the one thing I wanted to say actually is if you want to, before the next question, let's um, just say kind of your um, size of the community that you're from. Um, and that might help because people listening in might think like, okay, how does this, like, where, where am I kind of in this whole game? And I know that we have um, different community sizes and even different roles within that. And I want to really bring it forward that, that it's possible for anybody anywhere um, because I see all of you doing it and that is how I know. So that's, <laughs> okay. So the second question I have, actually, I'm going to change the order, Chantal, is uh, you're right, you know, if you, it's the same every time, then it's kind of like, mm, whatever, like, okay, so Chantal, you're first next, it's going to go back around, and then maybe the third time, I'm just going to, you know, mix it up again, so Chantal, you're on first this time. Okay, so, um, and I know a lot of you have some just amazing examples of how you have taken steps to cultivate arts and culture initiatives, or events, or, like, all of that kind of thing. Like th again, think of this broadly. Like it doesn't have to just be things that's like, you know, we don't have to think of, you can think of it in any way that sort of makes sense to you. So, so how have you in the past taken concrete steps um, to support arts and culture initiatives? What does that look like? Um, especially maybe if people are like, I'm not an artist, like I don't know, um, or maybe they are. And yet it seems like something that is not sort of like, you know, the kinds of things that economic development is normal, like, dealing in. Um, so what kind of concrete steps can people on this call um, take to support arts and culture initiatives or what steps have you taken in the past to, to sort of make that make it happen, foster it? Gentle. Um, one of the things I guess if you're coming into this and you aren't really sure of what kind of cultural assets or creative assets that your community or region may offer would be to um, take an inventory, um, you know, do the do the, the dirty work and get yourself really familiar with what your landscape of cultural assets and community assets, arts assets look like. Because once you take that inventory and go through that work of documenting everything and mapping it out, um, some of those opportunities to develop strategies around that and to develop, say, partnerships and some of those pieces that really, you know, spending $3,000 and getting the amount of value out of that, um, when you start to actually look at what, what resources that you do have, you can start to leverage those. But like anything in economic development, if you don't know what you have, or you don't know what you're working with, your path to grow that and leverage that is obviously going to be a little bit rockier. So um, really just understanding your community and your region's cultural assets and industries. Um, and then performing some economic impact. You know, when I, I so I was previously in Minidosa and we have a music festival there and it is actually a cooperative. It was previously privately run and had shifted due to some, I guess you could call them legal challenges in the private industry and was, but the opportunity was there to grow it. And so they um, took 
the whole of that. And we were going to be looking at doing economic impact analysis because for that group, that would have supported their ability to go out and get additional funds and be able to leverage what they are contributing to the community in that capacity. But for themselves to just be able to do that wasn't necessarily something that was within the scale of the scope of their resources. So being able to support some of those regional initiatives and regional businesses, entrepreneurs, et cetera, to be able to understand their businesses as well. Performing some of those economic impact analysis can help you to obviously see where the growth in your community is coming from as far as arts and culture, and then gauge their contribution to your local economy. Um, targeting specific sectors within it, so whether it's film, um, handicrafts, music, depending on what your community strengths are, is obviously very valuable. Um, strengthening your nonprofit sector is huge within this market because a lot of our arts and culture is coming out of and supported through the nonprofit sector, which isn't necessarily captured in your business development activities. So capturing what that sector is bringing into your community and supporting your nonprofits to be able to create different um, art, uh, opportunities here in Beaujadar and working with the Pinawa Art Gallery to develop a tourism experience. And that is based on um, a, a kind of a historical perspective of, of women in art. And for that, it's creating a for-profit opportunity, which will drive tourism, it'll drive visibility, and it'll drive people right into the community and into their art gallery. But it's still a nonprofit. So you know, we're supporting that initiative to grow tourism in that region, which is really great. Um, also, there's a lot of, say, artisans and businesses that are so focused on their craft, they're not necessarily in a position to go out and try and learn all about running a business. So providing, whether it's business boot camps for art-based businesses and reaching out to those specific people who have opportunities for growth or develop their product into a marketable product, as opposed to, say, a hobby, is a good business development strategy and as well then develops your products and your local products that you can export locally. Um, and that's a really good opportunity as well to create new, say, Main Street businesses as well, um, different opportunities to fill um, real estate space through that and grow those businesses. Um, and as well, then linking and promoting your arts and culture. So if you have a series of small independent businesses, events and that kind of stuff, linking it right within your local and regional tourism strategies and being able to provide some marketing support for these businesses as well because a lot of the times they're very disconnected and like I said they're you know a lot of times people are focused they've got a full-time job and a hobby and they are not in a position to be able to do all of that and build it themselves so linking that in obviously not only supports them in their business growth but also supports your placemaking your tourism strategies and the type of place that you would be marketing which is going to attract a lot of those different types of tourists who are maybe looking to get off the beaten path and experience the artsy side or the more you know culture and heritage related assets that your community has to offer if you can um, build that right into your tourism development and marketing strategy will make it a priority not only for your community but for those people as well to recognize that they're getting the support in that as well i'm done yeah those those are great points from chantelle it's pretty hard to kick off kick off of those but um i think i don't know how many um counselors we have online here versus economic development officers versus artists but if you are a leader in your community let's just call it that um find ways to invest in easy access events for people in your community the best way to start kicking off some of these things is to get the involvement of the people in your community and really start building that sector of participation and um, especially, this is especially valid for smaller communities, is the more things you can hold in your own community and activities that people can participate in, um, the more likely they're going to stay home and spend that money at a restaurant in town, at a store in town, um, et cetera, versus going to a larger community to experience that event somewhere else. And these don't have to be expensive items. Find those easy access points. It can be $200 worth of string lights and some chairs out and have a coffee cart and have people come out and um, try a paint night on the on the corner. It's it can be something really, really simple as that into these much larger events. So my community is 20,000 people. Um, we have some very expensive events, such as the Big Valley Jamboree that um, 
it's it it's it's hard to compete with but the um but then we have small corner stop events we have um, musicians in the park and i cannot um state this enough that you need to invest in the talent you have in your community just as you would a lawyer or a doctor or a um, I guess a doctor is a bad example because the provincial government will pay for that, but um, a lawyer or um, an accountant or somebody like that, if you're asking for their expertise and their help in your community, you're going to pay them, pay your artists, make sure if you are asking someone to perform at an event or a community function, you're paying them. If you're asking for an artist to come in and uh, do an experiential art during an event, um, so you can partner, say, a chamber of commerce with an experiential artist at a Chamber of Commerce event, and that is the entertainment, is watching this person create the, um, create the art. Pay them for that. Don't ask them to do it for free. So make sure you're investing in those people in your community too. You are more likely to retain them. They are more likely to spend those dollars regenerating in your own community. Um, so those are like some really tactile things that you can do. Um, uh, and then build on that and create a community identity around that art sector. So um, it, I'm sorry, Chantal, I can't remember the name of the community, but your community that had the big music festival really could build an identity around that. Camrose is very well known for their, ba their, for their big Valley Jamboree. There's an, there's an identity built around that. And just like you can build an identity around a hockey team or an industry in your community, you can build your identity around this art theme. And more and more we're seeing people are shifting from purchasing things to purchasing experiences as our demographic ages. And so if you can capture that market of people um, purchasing experiences versus things, the more you're going to be able to draw people into your community. So once you've kind of figured out what that identity is and Chantel really led into, into this, um, then that's where you tie into your marketing and tourism thing and really promote yourself. Think of Stratford in Ontario. They are lucky enough to come along with the Stratford name, but they have built an entire industry around that theater experience that they have in the summer. Um, there are examples of this in every single province across this country, and um, you can really elevate even the smallest place with that experiential um, arts and culture event. So Patricia's comment about investing in the arts um, really hits home with me because uh, my community is 1800 people. We have a trade area of around 12,000. We're um, halfway between two cities, so about 70 kilometers from uh, two cities each way. Um, and, you know, not a lot of small towns have access to um, art venues and culture. So the our town um, had taken over a building and we leased that building to um, a group of people who came together and um, started the Station Arts Centre uh, Cooperative. So, you know, I feel like as a municipal employee, we're there to build relationships um, with with the community, whether it's the arts world, the, um, the businesses, but they're all connected really. And uh, so I think it's, you know, we have a, a bit of a responsibility to uh, ensure that those relationships stay strong between the different um, community organizations and uh, try and hold that together. And I know for a small town, I know that's what we're known for is our Station Arts Center um, you know, in the arts world. And, um, you know, we're very proud of that. And uh, every time we get new council members, I have to say, sometimes it's a challenge trying to explain why this is so important. But um, we've been able to do that um, since the late 1980s. And, um, and with COVID, it um, really changed things for our Station Arts Centre. We used to have 6,000 people come through town uh, through the performing arts. That stopped uh, during COVID. So that was a huge impact and the businesses realized that. Um, so now we're, you know, trying to keep those relationships strong. They're looking at change. They're looking at trying new things. Um, and if it doesn't work, they're not scared to try something else until we can find something that 
um, is fitting. So. I think Nicole, your comment was a perfect lead in for my next question. Um, we talked about um, this a little bit on our previous call. So, um, and, and if this is kind of not, you know, your, your main point, then that's okay. We can, um, you can talk to something else, but I, I did want to ask a little bit about, um, because I, I feel like everyone on this call is fairly friendly to arts and culture uh, as a, a sort of a way of doing economic development, a tool, an asset. Um, I think Patricia, you had said before, I don't know if you've said it on this call, but elevating it to the level of an industry. Um, so yes, we're, we're all kind of bought in uh, to that, but you know, there's an element to which then we need to also buy other people into that vision. Um, and, and that's just going to be typical. Everyone um, is going to have to take this and communicate it to other stakeholders. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how the best way is to communicate that? I know, Patricia, you were doing that right from the outset because you said about like, first it was like the money, the dollars and cents. Yeah. So, okay, that's good. You know, actually, I'm going to start with you because you were in the middle both times. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with you this time. But, um, you know, when it comes to that, and, and I think everyone's sort of spoken to that at least a little bit about how, um, you know, it, just because economic development sees that it's important to support, um, you know, you can't do it alone. You, you're going to need other people to support those initiatives in some way, shape or form. So how's the best way to communicate those? Um, what if you found that works? I mean, what doesn't work? I don't know if you want to go there. <laughs> um, but anywhere you'd like to go with that, Patricia, start us off. Sure. You know, um, Chantel kind of hit on it. it always if so from a council perspective let's talk council at the very start because that's that's a good place to try and get money frankly um so if you are speaking to councillors about a, an event in your community and why it should be supported in your community there's three different key things you want to talk to them about you want to talk to them about how it connects people to the community and makes them feel ownership in their community um, you want to talk about the mental health aspect and engaging youth um, it is scientifically proven people that take part in the arts, either as a spectator or as a participant, um, have better health outcomes. And there's a ton of research on this. Um, they also, the ton of research shows that they feel more connected to the community. So exactly what Chantel said about um, people looking for experiences in their community when they're looking for places to relocate is 100% true. Um, the third thing you want to talk about is how money regenerates in your community when you invest in the arts. So um, the, there's a, a fairly typical factor that people use. It's eight to one. They say if you invest uh, $1 in the arts, it regenerates eight times through your community. This is a really key thing that is actually at a very high level, specifically to arts and a little bit in sports as well. Um, is that regeneration factor. So if you think of a theater production, for example, um, in our community, we have a, a theater grant, uh, or sorry, a theater company. It's a youth theater company that gets um, typically $13,000 in grants from the Alberta government. Um, they get private sponsorship of about $5,000. So you can scale this down so it fits into your community. But $13,000 in Alberta government grants, $5,000 from private sponsorship, and they put in about $32,000 in, in um, fees, et cetera, ticket sales, that kind of thing. $50,000 total budget in the community. If that's regenerating within the community, it's going through the prop builders, it's going through your paint stores, it's going through your restaurants where people are eating when they come, um, come to the shows. It goes through, so that you've, you've taken that $13,000 um, that you've gotten from outside your community and regenerated that eight times through the community, you're looking at 10,000, no, $100,000 in community revenue. So if you, if you can help support um, community groups in getting outside funding as well as matching funding that you're getting from your own community, that's where you really start to see those generation factors happen because you can put on bigger events, et cetera, et cetera. So if your community only has $200 that they can provide to an arts event, see if you can match that to something that the government at the provincial or federal level can provide. So there's individual grants, there's organizational grants. Um, anyways, I think I just went off your question a little bit, Heather, about how, but, but the regeneration factor is the key in that. And every time you can match an outside dollar to an inside dollar, it regenerates more. 
Did that answer, answer your question? Oh, that and more. I think I, uh, I think I flew off that way a little bit and then. It's okay. That was a good way. Back. So that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just all about starting this conversation here because. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention too, if anyone has questions and they want to put them in the chat, now's the time. We're going to just be on the panel here for a couple more minutes and then we're going to break out into those discussion um, rooms. So I'm going to let. Um, Nicole, if you want to speak next, and then Chantal will close off with you um, on this question about communicating, the, you know, your experience in communicating arts and culture to other stakeholders. So I rely a lot on the um, on the uh, station arts administrator to provide us the the stats, uh, their survey results, their 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 personal feedback uh, from different events they've had, so that we can show an impact to different groups and organizations. Um, you know, uh, the pride that is, is seen in the kids when they leave um, the Station Arts Centre, that is something, you can't measure that. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's very cool to see. Um, you know, I, I guess that's basically what I, what I have to say about this because again, those relationships with all the different organizations and making sure all that information is provided to those groups is very important. Um, yeah, in my experience, I think if you, I mean, obviously data helps as much as you can collect data and um, whether it's testimonials and data, numbers, survey results, um, say number of increase, you know, this year over last year, whether it's sales or visitation, any of that kind of stuff to support what has been done and support continued investment. Um, being able to link the initiatives to existing economic development or community development strategies. So whether it's your tourism development, business development, workforce development, um, product development, any of that kind of stuff. If it's Main Street revitalization, any of those pieces, arts and culture can really play a large role in that um, as well supporting the kind of the pieces that aren't necessarily just related to say that specific event, but recognizing that if an event is bringing people in from out of side of the community, that the outside of the community money is also coming with those people. So your hotels, your restaurants, your small local businesses that generate income and revenue based on that visitation is also to be captured when you're trying to communicate the value of this, right? So. Um, something as simple as saving your farmer's markets, right? How many local handmade producers are selling through a farmer's market and there's money going in to through the pockets of all of those people, but it's not necessarily captured in what is happening on Main Street or what's happening in your, say, business sector because it's a little bit off the beaten path. So if you can kind of start to collect that data and really link it back to what your priorities are already established as a community. And then... Um, of course, from there, if you have opportunities to have people come in and tell their story, a lot of the times, um, you know, people aren't necessarily connected to it until they hear it or they get a little bit more face to face with what's happening. So um, being able to bring the right people together and say whether it's generating partnerships and creating some um, connections that way so that people feel a little bit more tied to those outcomes is definitely a way so if it's bringing in council to have conversation directly or any of those pieces or bringing in some of those key stakeholders and really connecting them to the people who are on the ground floor and would be impacted by those benefits um it's definitely opportunity it's sometimes with arts and culture it kind of gets a little bit lost, lost in the wash and it's you know you've got a committee for this or you know a small business over there and we're so focused often on you know big business and what's happening or who's struggling that some of the the small just a little bit more lost in the wash or again those smaller events you know that you don't necessarily recognize or attach those economic benefits to because we're so busy looking at what that big main driver is so being able to kind of step back from that main driver and start to accumulate what those benefits are of all of those smaller pieces um, having you know music in the park and those just those little pieces that bring people into your community and allow them to experience what that quality of life is in your community and what it is you know not just on this weekend when you're attending something where there's 25,000 people, but on average every day, um, 
where you can have people come in, experience that quality of life. And then, because those are the kinds of things that really do start to attract people to your community as far as relocating and retirement or starting their own business and doing those things is when they come to your community and they can, you know, really sense that impact. So if you can get those people all in, you know, on the same page of, of what those values are and communicate them in a way that's meaningful and not necessarily just data, but data definitely helps um, to be able to communicate those impacts and those opportunities for sure. Fantastic. This is an excellent panel. I know that um, I want to give a little bit of time for our breakout rooms and that's that's fine if we cut into those because uh, I want to have this discussion here. Um, and actually, Kyle, if I can just get you to put the question for the discussion in the chat so everyone can see it. Okay, so we have one question, um, but we'll give a couple minutes to answer these. So the first question is uh, from Wendy. Do you think fully volunteer run nonprofits are sustainable moving forward? Or is there a better business model that should be used, such as private businesses taking on some more of those previous areas, um, performing arts, et cetera? How have groups, uh, how do groups hand off what they've been doing to other entities? So around the long-term sustainability <laughs> yeah. types of organization. Okay, go ahead. Volunteer burnout's a real thing. Um, as a community, uh, one of the things that I really would like to see um, is where the, the city as an organization can support organizations um, in non-financial ways as well, and then help transition to like board development, give them opportunities for board development. I think Chantel, you had mentioned um, about providing business coaching, that kind of thing. Um, but basically supporting a transition period, just as you would support a transition period for a business. Um, in economic development, it is something we do is try and transit, help transition businesses from one owner to the next, right? Um, so I think there's that support. Um, having a business take over the nonprofit might be a challenge because it's a different mindset. Um, but that's, and this isn't just a plug for the people that are hosting us here, but that is where cooperatives come in is where these actual producers can join together and create a, a consortium basically to elevate their work across the board. Um, in terms of arts events, one thing I have seen that's really successful is um, where a community will give seed money on a rotating basis. So the first year it's, it's like a hundred percent support of a group of a small group of people next year it, it goes 75 50 25 but then it starts rotating into the next event so it's a constantly regenerating stream of events and it's building more and more events in the community and building that capacity in the volunteer community so maybe you don't want to maybe you don't want to be part of this music festival but you want to be part of this ice sculpture carnival or something and it, it creates year-round events by that rotating funding that's fully weaning groups off of the support that they're getting from the community and giving that support to someone else. So that's another, another thing that I've seen actually work really well. Uh, I think in my experience with the nonprofit pieces, I guess it really, <laughs> like anything, it depends. Um, so if, you know, like a lot of, a lot of models, a lot of what happens in arts and culture wouldn't necessarily be considered profitable. Um, or justify the amount of effort and energy that goes into it as a for-profit business. Um, and I, like I mentioned with uh, Rock in the Fields of Minidosa, that's that large music festival. As a private industry and as a private business, it was bringing in 25,000 people into our little community of 2,500 people. When it converted to a cooperative it started a lot smaller. They started at 2,500 and trying to grow to 3,000 and then 35. And it was a slow growth and a bit of a different model because it wasn't necessarily based on that profit, but it was sustainable and it was community owned. And then the community had a lot more buy-in to it as a cooperative and as a nonprofit. And then those funds are actually returned directly to the community. Any of the profits that are made, they take a certain amount that goes back to generating and growing the festival for the next year and a certain amount that goes back into donations to all of the community groups and the volunteers and organizations that help support the festival over the course of the year and help actually pull it off as far as a community owned festival. So it would really, I would say, depend on what the nature of that initiative is and what the best model is in your own community and what those challenges are because one model may work somewhere and it may not work somewhere else depending on some of those dynamics. So. Hate to say that it depends, but that <laughs> that would be my answer. I know for us, knowing yourself, right? <laughs> so, 
for us in Rostron here too, we, I mean, that's one of my fears is that um, this volunteer group, you know, it changes as people age and new people come in and, and different things. And, and so what happens if it, you know, pretty soon we're not having any volunteers. And so as a town, we try and, and do that. We give, we give a, um, a grant every year, but we also try and do some volunteer labor and things like that, or, or provide some labor uh, so that volunteers don't have to do it there. Um, but one thing too, that board, um, they know they have to change. And so we're, we're supportive of change because we know that needs to happen to keep the interest there. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. But. So we have another question and um, if you don't mind, I'll just get um, one answer on this one. So again, we can go to those discussion groups. So I don't know if I'll ask the question, then you can just like nominate who you think should be the answer. <laughs> just like a voting thing. I don't know, I'm sorry if it's weird now. Um, but what kinds of efforts are communities putting in to capture the data about the benefits of hosting art and cultural events? For example, ticket sales, hotel bookings and such. Do communities need help of private sector with presenting and communicating such data? um to investors entrepreneurs artists and themselves i suppose if they could afford it that would be nice <laughs> um who does anyone want to speak to that question we can also do like a uh a, an emailed off answer later so i'm just looking for um if you google economic impact indicator analysis or some it's something close to that I can I'll try and find it and get it to you there is a model that I used um, in calculating the regeneration factor for the um, feeder group that I talked to before um, it is online and it is duplicatable um, I'm going to put the caveat that those numbers are very general because we haven't paid someone a, a significant amount of money to come in and grab those numbers um, the numbers off of the dance festival for example was that was a contractor that came in, did exactly what um, that list of things, the ticket sales, the, how much people spent in restaurants, that kind of thing. Um, there is sometimes government funding to get those kind of contractors in to, to, to do that kind of work. Um, but there is that established economic model where they say, okay, if it's X amount and it's this kind of activity, it's going to be regenerated at this level in your community. And it will give you a very kind of grasp of what that impact will be. Um, uh, you know what, I'll try and find it um, from my notes here and get it into the chat. And if not, I can give it to Heather afterwards and send it out. All right, thanks so much. I'm going to call it here on the panel, but I just thank you so much to these panelists. Um, really, really fantastic insights. Um, and I'm so excited that I found that we found this panel to talk about this topic because it was fantastic.